Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, since I'm the MP for Toronto Centre, I am going to start again by saying for everyone who wasn't here last night, welcome to Toronto and to Canada. I was uh, mocked on Twitter for uh, praising and bragging about our balmy weather yesterday by some of the Californians who are here who said it didn't really count. And I'm going to double down on that and say, wasn't it a beautiful day today? It's always like that. And thank you very much to INET and CG for having this absolutely fascinating event here. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask Larry uh, some questions. And that is sort of scary for me uh, because Larry is a very formidable person and for me has the extra intimidation factor of me having met him when I was about 19 years old. And at, in those days, the special thing that I was most interested in was, believe it or not, the Soviet Union still existed, and Larry was the economic advisor to the Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic. So that's where he started. He ended up Secretary of the Treasury. Not too bad, Larry. Um, so I'm going to start, Larry, by asking you, INET, Institute for New Economic Thinking. This group came together in the wake of the financial crisis as people said, you know what? Our economic orthodoxies clearly are inadequate. We need to rethink things from first principles. What do we need to rethink? What needs to change? in the classic macroeconomic textbooks in view of what the financial crisis has taught us? All that in a couple of minutes. Uh, Christian, let me just say I'm glad to be here. I think this is a very important uh, effort, and I will have served my purpose if I, have, uh, if I say some things that provoke some of the younger scholars here to do research to prove me wrong. Uh, nothing could be uh, more useful uh, than that. Um, Bill Janeway and I were just uh, talking, and to paraphrase what he said, uh, it was something very wise. The 2008 financial crisis was a terrible thing for the world, but it was actually a very good thing for economics because it forces a great deal of reflection and reconsideration. I think, roughly speaking, it forces a reconsideration of almost all the conventional wisdoms embodied in both New Keynesian macroeconomics and even more New Classical macroeconomics over the last 25 years. What do I mean more specifically? Number one, macroeconomics is about output gaps, not about the variability of output. Any model, which is essentially every model in every graduate macroeconomics textbook of the moment, that assumes that the only thing policy can affect, that the only thing that the subject is about is the volatility and variability of output, not its average level over long periods of time, is entirely missing. Uh, the point. It's about the output gaps and avoiding the output gaps that the real subject is. Number two, it's not about stochastic processes. It's about events. Much of what macroeconomics properly is about is not the small wiggles in GDP between 2004 and 2005, it is about events like the 2008 financial crisis, events like the Japanese bubble bursting, events like the Depression, events like the crisis in the Nordic countries in uh, the early 1990s. And we need conceptual approaches and modes of thought that go to the prevention and the management of those kinds of events, because that is what is most important for our fellow citizens. Number three, a proper macroeconomics must recognize the central role of finance, the central role of debt, 
the central role of leverage, the central role of human psychology, the central role of the core human emotions of greed and fear. Because that is what is behind those, each of the major events that uh, I just described. And notice how I talked about the financial sector. Um, it was very conscious the words I chose. I did not emphasize new and varied financial instruments, though they obviously have their risks and need close attention. I emphasized things that have been there forever, loans, leverage, bubbles, greed, and fear. Because if you think about it, the most important fluctuations have had the most to do with those things. There wasn't any important financial innovation in Japan in the late 1990s. There wasn't any highly consequential financial innovation in the United States in the late 1920s. What there was was loss of judgment, cycles of uh, greed and fear. And the last, uh, I'm going to say two more uh, things, actually. Um, the next thing that I would say is um, needs to be in the textbooks. And this, I'm sure of its importance, but how to conceptualize it and how to reduce it uh, to an economic model is something that I hope somebody in this room will uh, figure out. The premise of essentially all economics on the subject is that leisure is good and work is bad. I am here to tell you that that isn't right. I'm here to tell you that there's overwhelming medical evidence that retirement is terrible for people's health. I am here to tell you that most of the people in this room would actually be unhappy if they were removed from performing any task and they still perform the sal still receive the salary they now receive. And that, of course, past a certain point, people don't want to work. Of course, there's disutility to work. But it is a much more complicated phenomena than that. And particularly as we gra grapple with both cyclical phenomena and structural phenomena around technological change, economics is going to have to find a way of recognizing the fundamental human satisfactions that come from making a contribution. And that is nowhere near the economics textbooks of today. So far, what I've said are a number of aspects of a successful macroeconomics that I believe needs to find its way into uh, the textbooks. I fear that to accommodate the realities of the next decade, a particular idea is going to have to find its way into uh, the textbooks. And that is the idea of secular uh, stagnation. The idea that the, there may be a chronic structural mismatch between the proclivity of people to save and the desire for those savings to be translated into investment. That it may be that interest rates are either constrained from equilibrating that system by the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates, or that the responsiveness of savings and investment to interest rates is not such as to make an equilibrium possible, or that the interest rates that are consistent with equating savings and investment at full employment are not consistent with sustainable finance because of the proclivity to Ponzi finance and bubbles that they generate. Or to put the point a different way, Keynes may have made a serious mistake in titling his brilliant book. It probably should have been called A Specific Theory 
of employment, interest, and money under particular circumstances, namely those circumstances associated with a chronic insufficiency of demand. And its insights, the relative potency and desirability of fiscal policy compared to monetary policy, the lack of a basis for assuming that economies are self-equilibrating and self-restoring systems, those may unfortunately be truths that will be important for us to recognize, probably not forever, but in the macroeconomic configuration uh, in which we now find ourselves. So we are now in a moment of secular stagnation. In some of your writing, you said, you know, we might be, we need to be cautious about it. Are you calling it? I think that that is, it is my best judgment about where the industrial world as a whole is. That absent structural changes in our economy, it will be very difficult for monetary policies to simultaneously achieve full employment and maintain uh, financial stability. It seems to me that that is supported by the last time the United States was anywhere near full employment, uh, the period from 2003 to 2007, when we were manifestly not pursuing sustainable financial policies. It seems to me that that is supported by the profound difficulty that monetary policy in Japan has had over the 25 years till now in generating levels of output that are consistent uh, with uh, full employment. I hope, that I'm, I hope that I'm wrong and there can't be any certainties in uh, judging uh, these things, but it seems to me to be a possibility that we have to reckon with. It was expected nowhere in the official sector that, or among private economists, the growth in the United States in the now nearly six years since the trough, excuse me, five years since the trough of the recession would fail to keep pace with potential GDP as it was then estimated, let alone to close the output, uh, uh, close uh, the output gap. So yes, I think this is a possibility that we absolutely uh, need to uh, reckon with, uh, plan, uh, plan for, and adjust to. If, if, as is possible, at a certain point, um, the gods of the markets will say, enough is enough, we've deleveraged enough, it's all okay, that will be an easy configuration to adjust to. It's not a bet I'd want to make, and it's certainly not a forecast I would want to rely on. So when you say this is a possibility... Well, I'm saying more than that. I'm saying it's, it should be a basis for planning, okay. recognizing that it is always possible uh, that, the problem will, that the problem will solve okay. itself. So it should be our base case? Should be a base case, yes. And what do we do about it? I think it's clear that where there is space, there is an overwhelming case for borrowing to finance public investment. And there is such space in the largest part, by far, of uh, the industrial world. There's no one in this room, I am confident, who admires Kennedy Airport. And I would say to you, if a moment when we can borrow money at less than half a percent for the long term, in real terms, in our own currency, and when the construction unemployment rate is near double digits, if that is not the right moment to fix Kennedy Airport, I don't know when that moment will ever come. And there are, and there are examples like that 
throughout uh, the industrial world. To name just one more, the United States has an air traffic control system that relies on vacuum tubes. And sometimes the vacuum tubes don't work, so it relies on little yellow stickums that they move around on bulletin boards. This in the 21st century, and by the way, extra air travel means extra consumption of fuel, greater risk of accident, not to mention uh, the passenger delays. Now, some people say we can't afford infrastructure uh, investments. First, there's a very good chance they pay for themselves, given the multiplier effects on GDP, the now clear fact, the clearly established fact of hysteresis effects that mitigating a recession today raises potential output tomorrow. You might call it inverse says law. Lack of demand creates lack of supply uh, in uh, the future. Given that infrastructure investments raise capacity and therefore raise output in the future, and given, and this is what's never said, somehow the people who are worried about the deficit think that they've got some kind of monopoly on morality in terms of the way we care about our children. I'm here to tell you that from the point of view of my children, I am a lot more worried about bequeathing them no investments in the advancement of science, bequeathing them a vast bill for deferred maintenance, bequeathing them a starved public sector that no longer functions because of attrition of all the most able civil servants, than I am bequeathing them paper debt that's accumulating interest at less than 1% in real terms. Those liabilities, those liabilities from deferred maintenance, they, it gets a lot more, when you defer maintenance on things, it get, it, it, I've seen it with houses where I've done it. it, it the costs grow a lot faster than one to 2% in real terms when you let the problems fester. And so we're gonna have not just a better economy if we invest now, not just more output if we invest uh, now, but in all likelihood, we will have a better FISC um, 25 uh, years from now. How does this affect secular stagnation? What does this kind of argument have to do uh, with uh, secular stagnation. Look, there are basically three ways of responding to secular stagnation. One is to hope it'll go away. The second is, and this is one that many serious people advocate, is, well, if the real interest rate needs to be negative, then the real interest rate needs to be negative, and we'll find a way to either drive inflation up to the point where the real interest rate can be negative, or we'll find a way to use quantitative easing type policies to drive down risk premiums enough. That's a second approach. And a third approach, which is the one I advocate, is to raise the level of demand at a given level of interest rate. Public investment is one way of doing that. Export promotion uh, is uh, another. Support for lower income consumers with a high marginal propensity to consume uh, is another. Removing regulatory barriers to private investment, of which there are many um, in both Canada and the United States, uh, is another as well. So there's plenty of things you can do to raise demand at a given level of interest rates. Why do I prefer that to pushing interest rates down in the hope that that will cause uh, the balance? Several reasons. Uh, one, I'm not sure just how efficacious those policies are, just how many investments are there that firms are not willing to make with a 270 treasury, bill, treasury bond rate that they would be willing to make with a 220 treasury bond rate. I'm not sure there are so many. Two, what are the consequences for financial stability of such low interest rates that give a massive incentive to uh, private sector uh, leverage to a profusion of uh, financial activity. Three, what are the distributional consequences of reducing discount rates and therefore inflating asset values 
when it is the top of the society that owns the vast majority of uh, the assets? And four, what is it that is uh, for, I worry, and this is something Richard Koo has, in a way, uh, emphasized, when interest rates are extremely low, then coupon payments on loans are next to nothing. And so zombie enterprises can go on for a very long time, as long as banks are prepared to lend and pretend. And so it seems to me that that's not a very healthy environment for the development of the private sector. Now, I want to be completely clear. As between accepting the reality of stagnation and doing nothing, I prefer easier monetary policies. But it seems to me that if we're going to find an ultimate solution in the industrial world, we need to find ways of increasing the level of demand at a given level of interest rates. And that is just not where most of the policy discussion uh, is. But it is, I believe, very much where it should be. So I hope the INET and CG crowd gathered here will agree with me that this is the kind of audience that is going to be quite receptive to the ideas you've just outlined, Larry. But not everybody is. And George Osborne has recently been taking a victory lap and talking about how UK growth, which has reappeared, is evidence that the secular stagnation thesis is wrong and austerity measures are right. Uh, George, uh, on Friday, uh, labeled me a friend and a critic. And I guess that was a fair uh, statement. Um, and I wish the British economy only uh, the best. And I, I recognize the uh, dedication, commitment, and perseverance that George has displayed in sticking with and advocating uh, the policies with which uh, he came into office. I do not believe that the British experience makes a case for austerity, very much uh, the opposite. First, the more bones you break, the better your convalescence will be. If you break a lot of bones, you will really feel much better when you convalesce than if you break hardly any bones. Britain is still 5% of GDP below its previous peak, still below its previous peak, unlike the United States, which is well above its uh, previous uh, peak. And so, yes, if you drive an economy far enough down, you can uh, see a rapid recovery. It was not generally Maybe believed, it was not recipe. generally believed, no American, to my knowledge, not one, claimed the 9% growth that the US economy enjoyed in 1933 as a vindication of Herbert Hoover's policies. <laughs> and it is the same syllogism, the further down, the further up. But it's not, but you have to look at the level, not at the rate of change. That's the first point, and that's probably the most important point. Second uh, point is look at how those policies, look at what is being done to stimulate the economy. Britain, in a, in a move I have to say I found surprising, um, reinvented Fannie Mae. They reinvented Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They put the credit of the government behind huge volumes of housing investment. Now, you know, you can argue that you really want to support the housing sector and so forth, but if your basic motivation is, as I believe was argued, the credit worthiness of the government, I can't understand how the credit worthiness of the government is well served by issuing massive guarantees in support of housing. And I'm no expert on, on, on this, but as I look at 
London real estate prices, they don't make a compelling case for the sustainability of uh, a monetary and credit-fueled uh, expansion. There's a third uh, point to be uh, made as well, and there's a lot of numerical and statistical uh, subtlety, uh, subtleties around it. But let's suppose you have the theory that, that I have and that I suspect most people in this room subscribe to, which is that if you have major contractionary fiscal policy, there'll be a multiplier, and over the subsequent 18 months, you will, um, output will deteriorate relative to what it would have been. Then suppose you do massive fiscal contraction in 2010, massive fiscal contraction in 2011, and some fiscal contraction in 2012, and some fiscal contraction in 2013. What would you expect to see? You'd expect to see that output would go down really fast for a while, and then when you stopped delivering new major fiscal contraction, output would start to behave better. What do the statistics of Britain's um, Office of Budget Responsibility show? They show exactly the pattern that I described, a diminution in the amount of fiscal contraction followed by a um, improvement uh, in uh, economic uh, performance. So there are many, many factors that drive the performance of an economy. And anyone who suggests that if they know what fiscal policy is or they know what monetary policy is, then they know everything that's necessary to forecast an economy is making a serious mistake. But if you ask, what would a, ra would a rational Bayesian change whatever view they had about the multiplier downwards in response to the British experience, I find that to be a very surprising uh, view uh, indeed. And so I don't think there's anything uh, in uh, the British experience uh, to make a case for uh, austerity uh, type uh, type views, and rather I would take uh, the fact that if you look at a six-year period since 2008, that the British experience hasn't even been that good relative to a number of the countries in continental Europe living under the euro, despite the opportunities that being free from the shackles of the euro represents, as further evidence um, that the austerity approach uh, may not be uh, the right one. Okay, tough final blow there. Britain, even worse than continental Europe. Look at the data since 2008 on, on Britain and France. Moving to causes of secular stagnation, what do you think is driving it? You know, I think this is something that there's room for a lot more uh, research on, and I certainly haven't done uh, formal research. I think the first thing to say is that if you look at either econometric attempts to estimate the equilibrium real interest rate for, for the United States, or as the IMF has recently done for the, industri for the world, or you look at uh, index bond yields, what you see, and particularly forward index bond yields, what you see is a clear downwards trend going back 15 to 25, uh, to 25 years. So there's pretty clearly a phenomenon there, and then the question is, what's the explanation? I can't give weights to these factors, and I suspect the appropriate weight on the different factors I'm going to mention, Christia, changes uh, over time. But here would be a number of them. Greater concentration of wealth and income means lower spending propensities and more incipient saving. 
a desire on the part of emerging markets to accumulate large amounts of reserves, and in particular, by running current account surpluses, and in particular, to hold those reserves in highly liquid, instru highly liquid instruments like U.S. bonds tending to depress uh, yields are two major factors on the savings side. On the investment demand side, slower population growth and labor force growth and possibly also slower uh, technological change, though that can be uh, very much debated, operates to uh, reduce uh, investment demand. My explanation that feels right to me um, is that there have been structural changes in the economy that reduce the demand for investment in fundamental uh, ways. Think about this. WhatsApp cost $19 billion, and it was 55 people working, on, working in some building in rented space. Sony is tens of thousands of people, it's capital, it's factories, it's all that stuff, and it's $18 billion. Think about, um, think about what the world was like when General Motors or AT&T or Exxon or IBM were iconic companies. They were issuing debt. They were investing on a massive scale to expand capacity and to build networks. Now think about iconic companies of today like Apple and Google. They have more cash flow fundamentally than they know what to do with. And the result of that, of course, is an excess, uh, an excess supply of savings. Another way to approach uh, the question is to say what's happened to the relative price of durable equipment, either producer equipment or consumer equipment, appliances? And the answer is those prices have gone way down. Well, when those prices go way down, it means a given unit of savings goes much further. All of that, it seems to me, operates to uh, reduce real interest rates in just what sequence and just which factors are most important at uh, particular points of time, I think can be very much, is very much open to uh, question and research. But I think for now, we have to maintain a significant presumption that equilibrium real rates are lower than they have been uh, in the past, that probably living with those low real rates, well, pushing real rates well above equilibrium real rates, as many in the central banking community continue to advocate, is it seems, and not doing anything else, is it seems to me a prescription for protracted stagnation. Accepting the reality of those lower uh, real rates raises the questions that, I've re uh, that I posed before around uh, financial stability. And what we need to be thinking about is how to do things in our economies, and I think increasing public investment where there is high productivity public investment to be done is the easiest and best way uh, to do this that will operate to raise equilibrium uh, real rates and raise output uh, at, uh, at the same time. Larry, in talking about some of the causes of secular stagnation, you've sketched out what some people might call the innovation economy, the knowledge economy, which has been a big focus of this conference. What's the impact of the rise of that economy on jobs, the type of jobs, and the number of jobs? Anyone who doesn't begin their answer to that question by saying, I don't know, and no one can know with confidence, is making a serious mistake. Um, so I do not presume uh, to be able to make uh, such a judgment with uh, confidence. And I think these are matters that require um, 
far more work than they have yet received. And so I think Jim made an important contribution by uh, important intellectual contribution in addition to his other contributions by pushing INET uh, towards uh, more focus on, uh, on innovation. My guess is not that bright. Um, I was an MIT undergraduate in the 1970s. At that time, there were lots of debates about automation. And there were people who said, you know, automation is going to make a lot of the jobs go away, particularly for men who work with their hands. And there were other people who said, that's stupid, um, because it's obvious, you idiot, that if people are more productive, then they'll have higher incomes. And if they have higher incomes, they'll spend more. And that will create the jobs, and the whole thing will balance out. And that was basically the debate. At the time, Bob Solo was the leading advocate of the second view. The, it was all going to work itself out, and we didn't need to panic about uh, automation. And so that's what, we were all, that's what we were all taught at MIT, and I believed it. Looking at the economic history of the last 40 years, I'm not so altogether convinced that I was right. In 1965, one out of 20 men between the ages of 25 and 54 is not working was not working. Today, it is one out of six men between the ages of 25 and 54 who's not working. And even when the economy has fully recovered, it will be more than one in seven men between the ages of 25 and 54 uh, who are not working. I choose that group because it's probably the group in our society that's easiest to look at because it's the strongest social expectation that uh, they will all be working. So in a sense, you look at all of that non-work, you look at the fact that real wages for high school graduates who didn't go to college are basically, at least as we measure them, lower than they were 30 years ago. And maybe we're already seeing a set of consequences that have already happened from the innovation that's taken place. And I guess I look at um, the driverless car, the bots that can write sports stories summarizing games about as well as novice sports writers, the computer programs that can perform a, provide a kind of psychiatric help. Gee, tell me how you feel. That must have been very hard for you. And these things really work and give solace uh, to people. Uh, I look at all of those examples and I don't know whether the study that was done at Oxford that suggests that 47% of all jobs are subject to replacement by technology is a reasonable estimate or not. But my suspicion is that there's a lot of uh, such jobs. And I've actually studied now the agriculture to the agriculture transition, because it seems to me there are a lot of activities, manufacturing canonically, that are going through a transition like the transition that agriculture uh, went through. High productivity, growth, low elasticity of demand, a shrinking sector, workers move out of uh, the sector. And I think there are two things to say about the agriculture comparison. The first is that real wages basically went nowhere, and by some measures downwards, for 50 years after the Industrial Revolution. And so it didn't really happen so all fired smoothly then. And the second thing is, if you think about agricultural workers being ejected as a consequence of high productivity and moving to the whole rest of the economy, and then you think about the size of the sector that's potentially being affected by technology and the size of the sector that people can move into, it, the ratio is not such as to give great comfort. And I guess the third thing to say is that the agriculture thing's largely over. I mean, we got less than 2% of Americans working in agriculture. And we've still got 
government present in agriculture on a financial scale that is pretty immense compared to the scale of the agricultural economy. And that's after it's all over, which speaks to the difficulty of these adjustments. So I think there's a very good chance that these are going to be very, very uh, profound uh, kinds of changes and that there are going to be real difficulties in giving everybody work uh, that they find uh, satisfying. You know, I think economies work better as circular systems where, you know, I, I've got what I'm good at and I do that and I sell it to you and you've got what you're good at and you sell it and you sell it to the next person and it all sort of goes around. I think they work better as uh, circular systems than they do as hierarchical systems where there are a very small number of people who have remarkable abilities and either their skill in rent seeking or very likely their skill in innovating, entrepreneuring, designing, and marketing causes them to get a vast share of the income and wealth, which they then use to hire everybody else. And full employment is achieved, but it's achieved by having people who become specialists in the cleaning of shallow ends of pools as opposed to the deep ends of pools. People who become specialists in elbow massage as distinct from knee massage. I don't think that's likely to be as healthy a society. And so it seems to me that uh, these trends are uh, potentially very serious and, and require a lot of thought. Now, all of that said, um, one of the books that I read in my first year of graduate school was entitled was by my colleague and somebody I admire a great deal, uh, Richard Freeman, and it was entitled The Overeducated American. And its thesis was that the skill, that the wage return from education had really declined very substantially and that there were issues of Americans being overeducated. That proved to be badly wrong. And I think it's very, very difficult to know what the cumulative impact of uh, technology uh, will be. You know, technology will replace traders before it replaces gardeners. Technology means that you don't have to be numerate to work a cash register in the way that you once did. And so it's not a priori entirely obvious what the full set of impacts of technology will be and how it will evolve. So I think one should speak with, uh, I speak about this with much less confidence than I do about the macroeconomic and cyclical subjects we were discussing earlier, Christia. But um, I worry and I think uh, a society has to be thinking and preparing for these contingencies and it is Far from obvious uh, to me, for example, that um, being on a jihad to raise retirement ages is a rational response to there being a question as to whether there's going to be enough work for many people to do. It is far from clear to me that being on a, that major efforts to reduce public employment and to reduce public employment in providing health care represent an entirely rational response uh, to the set of circumstances uh, that uh, I described. I mean, maybe here's another way to put it. Um, if you look at consumer price indices for different goods in the United States, they're all normalized to be 100 in 1993. If you look at the consumer price index today for television sets, it is six. 100 in 1983, six 
today. If you look at the consumer price index for a college education, it's above 600. So there's been a hundredfold relative price change. Now, you know, I chose those examples to make a point, but if you looked at durable goods and education, you'd find a relative price change of well over five, uh, well over five to one. Well, if you think about it for another minute, you'll realize that the things that are getting more expensive tend to be the things that are more in the public sector. And what's the right response if these are both necessary and their relative prices change dramatically? It's likely to be some increase in the appropriate scale of uh, the public sector. And that's something I think we're going to have to figure out how to reckon with. Politics seem to be going in the opposite direction. I've noticed. <laughs> As you have been sketching out, Larry, what you might call and what I think you have called this sort of neo-Downton Abbey economy of elbow massagers and shallow end pool cleaners, it made me think of Thomas Piketty's book that I know a lot of people here have been reading. What is your take on it? It's a long book. And so I'm still thinking. I'm still thinking about it. I'm going to be writing. I'm going to be writing a review, which will be published in the New York in the, in the New York Times, um, about in about a month. Look, I think there are a number of aspects of it that stand out and have got to be right and hugely important. One, inequality is not just is not just or mostly about more skilled workers versus less skilled workers. It's got an enormous amount to do with the top one in 100, one in 1,000, and one in 10,000. That's got to be right. And it seems to me that that is an enormously important thing to document broadly. Two, the questions of the capital share and the role of profits are an important aspect of the dynamics of inequality. And a world in which capital is doing better and better is going to be a world that is going to tend to be a much more unequal uh, world. And that has to be an object of uh, focus. I think that is right. Third, the idea that in order to address that, you're going to have to find ways of fostering international cooperation. Because any one jurisdiction that attempts it alone is going to find itself losing uh, its uh, capital to the detriment of its workers is, I think, a very important idea. There is effort underway uh, to go after tax havens, to clean up uh, regulatory uh, havens, to bring about more transparent uh, reporting, to address tax competition. It is a subject, you know, when I was Treasury Secretary years ago, I tried to address um, what I used to call the dark side of capital mobility, uh, tax evasion, regulatory arbitrage, and uh, money laundering. But I think it's fair to say that um, there's a huge further step uh, that, uh, needs to, uh, that needs to be taken uh, if we're going to go after that. But top of, the, top, of the heap, huge, top of the heap is where the action is, yes. Capital, very important, yes international cooperation to find ways to tax capital income uh, more effectively? Absolutely, uh, yes. There are two other aspects where I'm less certain. I'm less certain of the fatalism uh, that, is, that runs through the book a bit. Uh, gee, uh, if we can't get it together to have an international agency 
levy a global wealth tax, we're doomed to perpetually increasing massive inequality. Since we're not going to be able to get together to have that international agency, that's a pretty depressing conclusion. And I'm a little more of the John Kennedy view that man's problems were made by man. It follows that they can be solved by man. And I think a combination of policies directed at limiting rent-seeking, domestic policies directed at more uh, progressive uh, taxation, improvements in uh, governance uh, arrangements can make meaningful differences, change social norms, can make meaningful differences with respect to the distribution of income. So I'm a little less fatalistic um, than the tone of the book. And tending to view things from a perspective of North America rather than uh, Europe, I think that the book gives a somewhat misleading impression of the relative importance of capital factors and labor factors. The fact that CEOs used to be paid 25 times what workers are paid and they're now paid 250 times what workers are paid is a rather larger part of the cumulative story than Piketty's analysis, which focuses on the capital share and the rate of return uh, to capital um, highlights. But look, uh, those are cavils, and they are, I think, important uh, issues. But a book would not be an important economic book if it did not throw out a set of propositions that were important for people to consider, debate, and argue about. So to say that there are questions I have about aspects of the argument and about the general tone is not to take anything away from the achievement that it represents. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to reading that review. I am glad you're a little more cheerful. It could be because you're not French. Uh, and we have about 20 minutes left for questions, and I'm gonna throw it open. And can I have my timer helping me so I don't have to keep on checking my Blackberry? I've been doing that not in honor of Jim Balsilli, but so I don't miss our time. Okay, let's start with Bill. Can we get the mic here, please, also? Because I think we're videoing this. Collaboration, collaboration. Um, Larry, secular stagnation. In the neglected <clears throat> and to an extent despised, addendum to the general theory. Keynes wrote that maintaining full employment might require, quote, the more or less complete socialization of the investment function, unquote, 1936. 1929, the public sector in the United States was 7% of the national economy. The federal government was 2%. By way of Social Security, the Defense Department, by 2007, federal government was, the public sector was order of magnitude 35%. That remarkable trans, and, and much larger than investment in the private sector. Did we, in fact, evade the threat of secular stagnation for two generations, precisely because we more or less socialized the investment function. Leaving people like Bill without a job, right? I don't think so. I'm on the side. <laughs> you know, Bill, I'm, my way of putting it, permanent, high unemployment equilibrium, I'm pretty far out there relative to the conventional uh, thinking. Uh, with uh, secular stagnation. I don't think uh, that you would, I think for that to be true, I would want to see the data suggest that we'd been sort of permanently from decade to decade to decade moving to larger cyclically adjusted budget deficits. 
because that's what would really be take the form of your being right. So we didn't used to need a cyclically adjusted budget deficit, and then we needed a larger one and a larger one and a larger one. And I don't think that would be the right reading of the experience of the United States. Uh, I would read the experience of the United States in the late 1990s as being we were able to run a really quite t tight fiscal policy and uh, enjoy very strong, uh, enjoy very strong economic growth. So I'm open to considering the possibility you suggest, but I think it probably has more to do with the various factors I adduced for lower equilibrium real interest rates than it does the idea that we really had this situation all along and we somehow suppressed it uh, with, uh, government, uh, with government activity. Okay, our friend Anatole Kolecki. Can I have the mic up here, please? Thanks. Uh, I want to ask uh, really the opposite of Bill's question. Uh, as, you, as you said yourself, Larry, uh, despite the uh, eloquence of your arguments on fiscal stimulus, you've noticed that politics seems to have been moving in the opposite direction. And I wonder whether there might be some way of reconciling, you know, the clear, certainly to everybody in this room, I think very convincing, uh, arguments on macroeconomic policy with what's going on in politics, not just in the US, but around the world, uh, by trying fiscal stimulus of a different kind. And I, I wonder what your reaction to this. So if you can't get more public investment, that may be a first best solution, would a second best solution be to have tax cuts particularly perhaps at the lower end of the income distribution, financed by monetary expansion, uh, or not. So tax cuts, would tax cuts be better than nothing if you can't get uh, uh, public investment? And the related thing on infrastructure investment, if you can't do infrastructure investment through the public sector, again for these arguably irrational political reasons, is one alternative approach to have more privatization so that you, could, you do it through the private sector, and that could potentially include even a lot of activities which are seen as public sector activities, as you said, education, health, and so on, which by their nature are consuming a larger and larger proportion of national income if they remain in the public sector, are they doomed to be perpetually underfunded? Okay, can I just say thank you, Anatole, for trying to come up with ideas which we poor politicians will find easier to sell. I appreciate that. Would they work? Yeah, I th look, uh, I, I don't think any, I think, I don't think the thinking in this sphere has progressed a lot since the 1950s and 1960s. If you give tax cuts, you basically have less, eff less efficacy in proportion to the uh, marginal propensity to consume of the people you give them to. And if you can find people to give them to who have a marginal propensity to consume close to one, the stimulus benefit will be about equally great. And there's a question as to how easy it is uh, to do that. I would say the uh, current readings of the empirical evidence in the United States are less encouraging. Than I, might have ex than I might have expected on the marginal propensity to consume question. On private, on stimulating, I, I mean, I tried when going through a list and to, to highlight the fact that I thought anything that stimulated spending was good, and so private infrastructure, yes. Um, here's the problem with private infrastructure and why I think there are limits to it. Um, take Toronto. I don't know anything about Toronto, really, so I'm just going to make this up. But you'll see the you'll uh, you'll see the point. Um, let's let's assume that the parking revenues of the city of Toronto are ten million dollars a year. How much would you pay as a private investor for the uh, for the rights? 
to all Toronto's parking revenues going forward for all of infinity. You might pay $80 million. You might pay $100 million. Maybe somebody would pay $125 million, though I doubt it. At what interest rate can Toronto borrow? Toronto can borrow at some interest rate that makes selling off its parking revenues for 12 times their current level, recognizing they'll probably grow with inflation, look a little crazy. And that's why when I look at private infrastructure, I worry that it's very easy for it to be a very bad deal for uh, the public sector uh, over the medium term. You said one other thing that I, that I want to comment on, um, and I want to state my view, and I suspect there's some other people in this room who have a different view, and if somebody can make a strong and convincing argument that I'm wrong, it would be something very important. And I'm not, I think I'm right, but I'm not 100% convinced. I mean, it's, it's a serious issue. And that's the notion you slipped into, that it would really be good to have some money-financed fiscal policy. My view is that money-financed fiscal policy is the same thing as bond-financed fiscal policy plus open market operations. That it's exactly the same thing. And therefore, you can't believe that money-financed fiscal policy is good, is better than bond-financed fiscal policy, without believing that open market operations are have an independent impact. And it's the essence of believing that we're in the liquidity trap that standard open market operations don't have um, an impact. Now, there are a number of people who have tried to make arguments that run contrary to that syllogism. Somehow it's the first one's a commitment to have more money or something. Um, and I don't see and understand the arguments. And so I am quite disinclined to enter into a discussion of the possibility of money financed uh, fiscal policy. But it's possible that I'm missing something, and it's possible that somebody will make some very important macroeconomic argument to the contrary. But I think it would be useful to get clarity on this subject, and either for progressives to stop saying the fiscal policy should be money financed, or for there to be, and that that makes a big difference, or for there to be a better argument than, or a more convincing argument, or a better explained argument uh, than the ones I've heard so far. Okay, let's have maybe one of the students over there, maybe one of the guys in the back. No, okay. Call on the guy in front next. Okay. First of all, thank you for giving me the possibility as a 20-year-old undergrad student to ask a question. Yeah. I've noticed a lot of. Okay. Thank you. What can we say? I've noticed a lot of long questions, so here's uh, two short ones. Just one short one. Okay. Uh, are we financially stable? And please comment on financial repression in the next decades. That was are kind of a sneaky two, but you can pick, pick which one you prefer, Larry. I don't know who we is when I say uh, financially uh, stable. Uh, the, US the US government and the Canadian government it strikes me that um, inability to service their, our debts is low end, is not high on the list of uh, problems that we face. I think the instinct to financial repression may be there, but it strikes me that the world is pretty global and there are a lot of places to put money. And even if one wanted to financially repress, I don't think in most of the industrialized world it's going to be that it's going to be that easy uh, to do on a on a large scale. Okay, question here, please. Yep. I think you have two mics coming to you. Let's see which one gets to you first. Larry. Well done. One, Thank one you. One thing, what you said about the 1990s. If we asked Calvin Coolidge in 1928, he would have said the same thing. But the, I'm sorry? What you said about the 1990s, 
being such a good situation, which it was, Calvin Coolidge would have said the same thing about 1927-28. So we ran a fiscal no, surplus. No, Paul, look, uh, Paul. But, but, but no, that, that's just a point. Let, let, me get to this, <laughs> let me get to this question. I agree with you that we're short of effective demand. The question is, one of the things you suggested was export-led growth. And Keynes in the general theory specifically says, if there's a shortage of export, uh, of effective demand, the last thing you want to do is to use the trade balance to stimulate demand. He says, what that does is create a disastrous competition where you shove your products on your trading partners and that creates problems for them and for you. And what was Keynes' solution? Well, he didn't get to the solution until Bretton Woods. And the solution was the Keynes plan. Where does anybody in Washington or anywhere else think about the Keynes plan as a way of solving these terrible balance of payments problems which create in the United States a shortage of effective demand for domestic products? Um, you, raised two, you, ra you raised two things. I, I think with great respect, uh, the Calvin Coolidge thing is a, is a, bit, of a, cheap, is a bit of a cheap shot. Uh, the, uh, the, lags are, um, the lags here are very, very different. If we'd gone into depression in 2001 or 2002, what I said would have been a, would have been a silly thing uh, to say, but I think at a certain point, you'd have to say, um, you, you, you wouldn't want to, I don't think you'd want to argue that whatever the imbalances were that built up in the 1990s were the cause of the downturn in, two, uh, in 2008. So I think, that, I, think, I think that's a little bit of a cheap shot. Um, you're obviously right that uh, the world as a whole can't improve its net export position, and that if somebody improves their net export position, somebody else has to have a deteriorating net export position. So as a general matter, I think the Keynes's notion that there should be a symmetric focus on adjustment is a useful one. I, I think people do not give enough credit for the fact that the Chinese trade surplus has come down by more than half. And that does reflect that, albeit not in a highly institutionalized way, that the world has been responsive uh, to this problem. I think there's something natural about uh, major oil exporters who don't have an infinite amount of oil running substantial surpluses while they are uh, during the period when they're exporting uh, oil on a large scale. I do think the place where these discussions are most relevant is to the situation within Europe where the magnitude of German surpluses seems quite problematic relative to, and the Germans' desire to maintain surpluses seems quite problematic relative to the desire to have others adjust. And I think in particular, uh, there's no clearer example of the fallacy of composition than the suggestion that's sometimes heard that Germany made a very difficult set of adjustments in the earlier part of the last decade, and that if other Europeans, if every other European just bit the bullet and did the same thing, all would be well, which fails to recognize that much of that adjustment took the form of running a substantial current account surplus financed with vendor finance to uh, the rest of Europe. So I do think, I do think it is um, an important, uh, important issue. Okay, I saw a few of our German colleagues wincing as you said that. Question here in the back. Yep. What order of magnitude are you suggesting for public investment? Given that the ARRA was 800 billion, are you suggesting a quarter of that or how much? And do you agree with Janet Yellen's uh, decision to ease bond buying? To what? Ease uh, the rate of bond buying. You know, I think I said as much. I think I said as much as I want to say about uh, monetary policy. Uh, I prefer action on the fiscal side, and in the absence of action on the fiscal side, I think monetary actions are better than uh, are are better uh, than uh, no actions. And if you heard that as evading a highly specific answer to your question, 
You heard it correctly. Um, <laughs> with, respect, uh, with respect to fiscal policy, I guess my reaction in the United States debate is that it's hard to believe we'll do too much. I think it's a little silly to discuss the size of the package without discussing how many years it's going to take place over and without discussing what's going to be included because sometimes in these packages, as with the $800 billion package, some of what's included is things that almost for sure would have happened uh, anyway. It seems to me what's important with respect to infrastructure investment is that it be a long-term pre-committed program with a recognition that at some point there may be a, it may be appropriate, depending on economic conditions, to begin tax financing, but that that's not appropriate uh, initially. And I think the danger of doing too much uh, is quite remote, starting from where we are now. Okay, we have time for one last quick question. <laughs> okay, I can't resist. You can get the last question. I'm sorry, Sony. Let this guy have a question, too. Hey, Sony. Okay, well, okay. Larry, Larry is so such a nice guy. You, Sony, get you the last question. You ask your question, you ask your question, and, and I'll we'll answer both of them. Okay, uh, well, my question is about tax arbitrage. And I have to compliment this conference as being one that has shown me that it is willing to talk about fraud in banking more than any other conference I've ever attended in my life. And I know for a fact that one of our speakers who was on this morning by the late of Nor Lord Adair Turner was in the Guardian paper in England for talking about banks as having a policy of tax arbitrage which damages the economy in so much incredible ways that the general public has absolutely no idea. And I would like you, Larry Summers, to explain what tax arbitrage really is and what it means to the public like me who suffer in that we have to pay banks from our tax dollars to rescue these criminal buggers for what they do to people like me, which is not people like you. So would you please explain it? What about me? Because you're wealthier, I think. Right? Because you're wealthier. OK, and so the final bonus question here, and you're going to get to decide, Larry, how you want to respond to these two. Yeah, top that one, Sony. There are pools of savings lying around. For example, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, as you mentioned, pools of savings, US pension funds, generating very poor returns. There are large investment opportunities, p potential high public and private returns, infrastructure in India, loads of other development. At an aggregate level, this is a large-scale failure of financial intermediation at the global level, part contributing to the pickle we are in. Is there, I mean, obviously we can't expect Goldman Sachs to step in as the financial intermediation between these two, but what is the public sector role, be it through the IFIs, et cetera, of intermediating between these two savings pools that are disconnected from the large-scale global level investment opportunities, and to what extent can this postpone or help tackle some of our global aggregate demand and stagnation problems? Okay, that easy one plus criminal bankers. Um, the American the American journalist, um, Mike Kinsley, put forth the doctrine that the real scandal isn't usually the illegal things people do. It's the things that are fully legal. And that is certainly true with respect to tax sheltering and overseas tax sheltering and tax sheltering by uh, financial institutions. Tax shelter, tax arbitrage, is, comes in forms that are mind-numbingly complex, but, in it, but its essence is that you borrow money and you deduct the interest on your borrowing and you put the money somewhere where you earn interest and you don't pay tax on the interest you earn 
And if you do those two things at the same rate and you can subtract, you recognize you make a profit that's equal to the tax rate times the interest rate on each dollar of your money. And there's no question that there's a lot of that that goes on. There's no question that um, but for successful rent seeking in individual countries, there would be substantially uh, less of it. There's no question that to fully address it would require more international cooperation uh, than uh, we have uh, now. And there's no question uh, that uh, it is a very serious uh, problem as I tried to convey uh, when I spoke about uh, the dark side of, uh, capital, of uh, capital mobility, I have no doubt that there are tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars that should be collected uh, by the world's fisks that are not um, because of the kind of tax arbitrage activities uh, that you describe. Um, I have asked myself exactly your question and uh, gave a lecture a few years ago at the uh, uh, Central Bank of India uh, in which I basically made the case that if a country had reserves, it needed a certain volume of reserves to perhaps equal to three months or six months imports, perhaps equal to all the short-term debt of the country that was coming due, perhaps equal to all the short-term debt of the country that was coming due, plus all the short-term debt of its banking system. Uh, to guard against liquidity crises, but that if it had far more reserves than that, that there was no reason to pay for liquidity when you didn't need liquidity, and that the failure to do so would mean uh, higher returns for the citizens of those countries, would mean more risk capital to meet substantial needs in the world. So I think, so I am 100% in agreement with the agenda. And at the time, I urged that the international financial institutions take an active role in supporting this kind of re reserve diversification. I was heard as suggesting that the IMF become a hedge fund, which was surely not my suggestion, which was surely not my suggestion. But it did seem to me that the international financial institutions could do a great deal in supporting this. And I think if one looks around the world, the trends are in the right direction uh, with respect uh, to this. They're, slow, they're too slow for your taste and for, uh, my, and for my taste. And some of it is the traditional conservatism of central bankers. Some of it is a kind of agency problem. Um, if I'm the guy who decides to invest our reserves in a riskier way, and we earn 6% instead of 1%, people will say, thank you very much. If we earn negative 3% instead of 1%, um, I will be publicly humiliated and my career will be over. And that type of reward system doesn't reward risk taking. I think that's an important aspect of it. I think another important uh, aspect of it is that there are, with respect to some of the most attractive projects, a range of governance uh, problems. Um, but I think this is a very important um, area. And I think the significance of these pools of capital, um, they're likely to grow and they're likely to become more important. I actually think, um, that part of what we're going to have to think about, though, and why this is kind of double-edged, is um, the political involvement uh, aspects uh, of these things. You know, when uh, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund decided that it didn't want to own, that it would not own Walmart's stock, that was in interesting kinds of ways a political statement of Norway vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And if you have far more activity of that kind, you're going to have far more of that kind of 
politicization, cross-border politicization of corporate investments. And the rules of the road in such a system are going to require thought. But I would completely agree with you directionally about the way things are going to move. Thank you very much for the chance to be with you.